By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are going to look at our second uh, match played in the Wizards Cup. So every Tuesday we will be featuring matches played in this tournament. Now, if you missed last week's episode, you can click on the info card that's appearing right now. And just to give you some info about this tournament, the Wizards Cup is all about building a deck with the Dark, Fallen Empire, and Homeland. So you get to choose cards out of those three expansions. And of course, you can choose basic lands as well. I mean, you need the mana, right? Um, there's also a restricted list. For example, Apocalypse Chime, the card that destroys all Homelands cards, of course, is restricted. Now, if you want to know more about the specific rules, about what cards are restricted, what cards are not, if you would like to see decks played in this tournament, you can check the description below, and there you will find a link to the website of the Wizards Cup. So there you can find all the information. Now, in today's game, we're going to look at Baron Nick, who's playing with a blue, black, red deck that he's called the Dark Alliance, and he's going to take on Michael Troop. And he is uh, playing with a deck he's called Musical Gargoyles. It's white and it's actually got a lot of artifacts in there as well. So very different deck. So it's probably going to be an interesting match. And I'm curious about the outcome. Now, uh, in a moment, I am going to go to the deck decks. I've got beautiful deck pictures of both of these decks. Now, if you want to skip that, like always, check the description below. There you will find several timestamps. One of them reads MTG Games. Click on there and that will take you straight to the games. And here I'm going to continue with the deck deck section. And I'm going to start with the deck of Baron Nick, UBR Dark Alliance. And here we see the deck of Baron Nick, UBR Dark Alliance. So a three color deck in this format. That is gutsy, definitely, because you don't have City of Rash, you have no dual lands. So how is he going to kind of fix this problem? And when I'm looking at his deck, the first thing I actually notice is that Baron Sengir in the middle. I guess when you give yourself the nickname the Baron, you got to play with Baron Sengir, right? Um, so let's just zoom into deck card. I remember when Homelands came out, this was one of the main cards that people were excited about. Like Homelands in general, people thought it was kind of underpowered, but Baron Sengir, uh, it saw play and people really wanted that card. So this is the card right here. It's a 5-5 flyer for three black and five to cast. And whenever a creature is put into the graveyard the same turn Baron Sengir damaged, damaged it, put a plus two, plus two counter on Baron Sengir. And of course, this card is strongly connected with its um, older brother, you might say, the Sengir Vampire, the card from Alpha, uh, that was a 4-4 four, four flyer and would get a plus one, plus one counter. So this card gets a plus two, plus two counter, but it's also a lot more mana, not five mana to cast, but eight mana to cast. So that's a big difference. And there's this interesting ability on Baron Sengir that actually got better over time. You can tap the Baron to regenerate target Vampire. Now, this is the thing, the errata of the creature type has changed Baron Sengir from a summon legend to a legendary creature, Vampire Noble. So that means that you can tap the Baron Sengir to basically save itself, regenerate itself. So that is pretty cool. Um, so the Baron Sengir is in the middle of this deck picture here. I guess the cards all the way on the right where you can see um, the Blood Moon and you can see the, the Sea Sprites, I believe they're called, and the Giant Oyster and Brothers of Fire and Fisher. Those are the sideboard cards. So there on the right, you can see the sideboard cards and uh, we also see some really interesting big creatures that are kind of tilted sideways. I think they're the under lieutenants of Baron Sengir, and they're also part of the sideboard, but they can come in if uh, reinforcements are needed. I believe that the Baron told me uh, told me that actually. So it's pretty cool. This there's there's probably a whole story behind this deck, but for now in this deck deck, I'm just going to focus on what does this deck want to do, and and a few cards that I want to point out that I think are going to be uh, relevant in this matchup. Now, one of the first cards, because I'm just going to start on the left here, there's so much to see here. So on the left, we see the red cards. And I think one of the stronger cards in this matchup is going to be Retribution. Retribution is two red and two to cast um, for, uh, I believe, is it an instant or is it a sorcery? I believe it's a sorcery. Let me just check to be 100% sure. Yeah, it's a sorcery. And what it says is choose two target creatures controlled by an opponent, bury one of those creatures and put a minus one, minus one counter on the other. The, um, that opponent chooses which creature is buried. Now remember, bur buried means that you cannot regenerate the creature. Now there's so much happening in this artwork, but I'm not going to go into that. But it is very, very 
fascinating artwork. Um, but why I think this is so strong in this matchup, uh, Baron is going to play against the mono white deck. So I'm expecting a lot of one toughness creatures. That means that Retribution can be a very strong two for one when you're in that scenario, right? You can kill one Pump Knight and actually the other one will also get killed because it'll get a minus one, minus one counter on it just to give Pump Knights uh, as an example in this one. And just to go on on that um, expectation of mine that Baron will face a lot of one ones, there's also a red Timmy in Homelands, which is which is kind of interesting, right? Um, it's called the Anaba Shaman. And Anaba Shaman is one red and three to cast. So that's pretty steep, right? Pretty high casting cost. Uh, it's a 2-2 creature, so at least you get a 2-2 for that. I mean, think of Raveka, Wizard Savant, where you pay 4 mana and you only get an 0-1. But okay, that's maybe that, that'll come in the deck tech later. Um, but this Anaba Shaman, you pay 1 red and tap it, and Anaba Shaman deals 1 damage to target creature or player. Again, I think this is going to be a very strong card in this particular matchup. Now, uh, another card that we see here that will probably have an impact is the Dwarven Catapult. Now, Dwarven Catapult is one red and X, and this is an instant from Fallen Empire, so it's quite interesting. And uh, what it does, you can pump X mana into this spell, and then it divides uh, the X mana over, it deals X damage, and it divides that equally over the creatures of your opponent. So just to give you an example, if your opponent has uh, three creatures and you uh, pay um, play Dwarven Catapult, you pay one red and three, it deals one damage to each um, creature that your opponent has because it has three creatures. You paid three mana, so three divided by three, one damage to each creature. Now, there's no option. It automatically gets divided equally and it's rounded down. So if you pay five, for example, and there are three creatures, it still only deals one damage to each creature. So there are definitely downsides to this kind of burn spell from Fallen Empires, but I think the big plus about it is it's an instant. So you can kind of do it during combat. You can do it in the end step of your opponent. It's just a very flexible card. And I know from my own playing experiences in the Fallen Empire tournament that we played earlier, the Dwarven Catapult is really a force to be reckoned with. Um, then under Baron Sengir, by the way, we see Serrated Arrows. Now, Serrated Arrows is one of uh, the cards that is restricted for this tournament. Uh, the reason is it's just such a good uh, killer of small toughness creatures, right? So if you want to give your small toughness creatures a chance in this format, I felt like Serrated Arrows would be a little bit too strong. So it's four to cast. And uh, when it comes into play, put three arrowhead counters on it. And during your upkeep, bury serrated arrows if there are no arrowhead counters on it anymore. But more relevant is what you can do is you can tap it and remove an arrowhead counter on serrated arrows and put a minus one, minus one counter on target creature. So that means that with one serrated arrows, you can potentially kill three creatures, right? Three toughness one creatures. Again, I think this is going to be strong against this mono U deck. Uh, we also see your Raveka Wizard Savant that we talked about a little bit um, earlier. And I also see, I believe that card's called the Narwhal. Pretty cool art. It's a 2-2 first striker from Homelands for four mana, and it's pro-red. So it's not going to be very relevant in this matchup. But it's interesting that he's chosen to play it main instead of in the sideboard. I guess he's playing it main because he wants to combine it with a card called Zelon Sword. And Zelon Sword is one of the first equipped cards, I guess you could say. It's a card from Fallen Empires, and you can tap it to give target creature plus O plus 2. And if you keep the sword tapped, the plus 2 plus O bonus remains on the creature as well. So the sword in combination with the Narwhal is make, makes it into a 4-2 first striker. And that actually sounds pretty good. Talking about cards that um, are, well, I wouldn't say pretty good, but are pretty interesting. We also see here three giant oysters. Now, giant oysters, two blue and two to cast for an O3 creature. And um, Giant Oysters, ah, it's so interesting. And again, one of these, that's what I love about old school magic. It's so much text on cards. I'll keep, keep reading it. Giant Oyster is definitely one of those cards. So what it does, if um, a creature of your opponent is already tapped, you can tap the Giant Oyster. And what happens then is during the untap phase, it doesn't untap anymore. So it's trapped by the Giant Oyster. And during your upkeep, so I'm talking about the upkeep of the controller of the giant oyster, you put a minus one, minus one counter on that creature, right? So it's a way to really slowly kill a creature and keep it tapped at the same time. Now, here's kind of the catch. If the giant oyster dies, then all the minus one, minus one counters are immediately gone. They're out of play, 
right? So that means that Giant Oyster is a tricky card to play with. It's great to kill those one ones, but if you've got a bigger creature, let's say um, the opponent is playing Mono White, he's playing Hand of Justice, right? He's got six toughness. He uses the hand to kill something. Then you use the Giant Oyster to keep the Hand of Justice tapped. It'll take you six upkeeps to kill the Hand of Justice. That's gonna be a long, long time, right? And if anywhere in those six turns, your opponent finds a way to kill your Giant Oyster, all those minus one, minus one counters are gone. You know, they don't remain. And I think that's something that, you know, they could have kept that away from the card. They could have said, you know, a minus one, minus one counter by the giant oyster, it is there to stay, no matter what happens to the oyster. Then at least the oyster would have been a little bit better, right? Um, still, it is a useful card in this format because you can keep um, an, an, a, cr a creature by, from your opponent tapped. You can slowly kill it. So I understand that the Baron is playing it. Obviously, he's also playing with four AO piles. I think almost every deck is playing with four AO piles. It's one of the strongest cards in the format. It's an artifact, so you can put it in any deck. And, uh, you know, you can use it on creatures, you can use it on the player. So it's just, it's so incredibly versatile. So I think it's some a card that we see in every single deck. Okay, this is the deck of Baron Nick. I could have talked about this deck for, I don't know, another hour or so, because there are just so many goofy and cool cards in here. Uh, but I also want to take a moment to look at the deck of his opponent, uh, Michael Troop. So let's go and have a look at his deck. I believe it's called Musical Gargoyles. And here we see the deck of Michael Troop Musical Gargoyles, and I guess it refers to the Abbey Gargoyle that is in this deck, and also to the Elven Lear that uh, are also a full play set up in this deck. So maybe let's just zoom into those two cards first because the deck is named after them. So we've got the Abbey Gargoyles, which I actually think is a pretty good card. Uh, the downside for me of the Abbey Gargoyles is that it's three white, but that doesn't matter because Michael is playing mono white, so that's all good. So it's three white and two for a three four flying uh, that is pro red. And it's actually relevant because he's playing against a player that has a lot of uh, burn spells, it has a lot of red removal spells like Fisher, but the Abbey Gargoyle cannot be hit by it. So I think Abbey Gargoyle could definitely be an all-star in this matchup. And then we also have the Elven Leer. Now the Elven Leer is kind of connected to the card from Alpha, the Giant Grove. Now Elven Leer is two to cast and you can sacrifice it to give target creature plus two, plus two. So you can pump your gargoyles and give it a Leer and make it into a musical gargoyle. I guess you get like a gargoyle dance when it happens. <laughs> I don't, Michael, let us know what you envision when you do that play, what happens. Um, besides those two cards, uh, basically what I see here is a very strong uh, wide deck, um, a deck that's got pretty good mana drops, like it's got a T1 play with Ecation Javelineers, it's got a turn two play with Orders of Lightbur, and then uh, for turn three, uh, there are, ooh, are there any options actually for the turn three slot? So I guess there are no uh, three casting cost creatures in here, but still you can do, you can play other things, maybe you can play a smaller creature and a bigger creature. So um, I think that the the curve of this deck is quite good, it's quite healthy, like it, you can really curve out with this. Um, it, it looks like a deck that will allow you to put some early pressure on your opponent. And I think in these decks, what's all, always really, really strong, in my opinion, is Hand of Justice. I talked a little bit about Hand of Justice earlier. So the Hand, I remember when Fallen Empire came out, people were very excited about the Hand of Justice. One white and five to cast, right, for a two six. So it's got six toughness. It's really difficult to get rid of this card. Uh, with, for example, a Dwarven Catapult, it's nearly impossible. And um, the Hand of Justice, you can tap it, and you need to tap three white creatures. Now remember, those white creatures, they can just have come into play, right? Because you don't um, use the ability of the white creature. You just tap them with the Hand of Justice. So Summoning Sickness doesn't really care about um, using uh, your white creature for the Hand of Justice. So that might be relevant to know. So you can tap the Hand of Justice, tap three white creatures, and then you can just destroy any creature in play. And that is kind of insane, especially in this format. It's just, it's so strong. And um, yeah, like I said, Hand of Justice, because of that six toughness, it's very difficult to get rid of. And in this format, within this restricted format of Fallen Empires, The Dark and Homelands, a card like Hands of Justice is just an absolute winner. Um, the card I'm missing a little bit here, and I guess Michael Troop, you thought about that, this, and it probably was, um, you know, in your in your uh, in the test phase, was probably part of the deck is uh, Ecation Town. Now I love the art of Ecation Town, 
Um, and what it does, it makes citizen tokens, and you can use those citizen tokens with your hand of justice. This was like one of the oldest uh, combos that I can remember, and I used to play that myself. So I'm kind of feel sorry for not seeing it here. I think maybe a one-off could have found a place in this list, but then again, I'm sure uh, you've tested it thoroughly and you know what works and what doesn't work in your deck. Um, another nice card here to, to point out is Miracle Worker, because what Miracle Worker... Um, does it's one white for a one one and you can tap it to destroy target enchantment card on a creature you control and why is that relevant well if we look back at um, the deck of his opponent today it's actually not going to be that relevant he's not playing with any enchant creatures but um in this meta in homelands you also have a card uh, called torture it's a black card and uh, that's actually seeing a lot of play in this tournament and then miracle work can be quite relevant also uh, Michael is playing with a nasty enchant creature himself. It's called Sarah Bestiary. It's too white to cast. And during your upkeep, you have to pay two more white or else it, it, um, the Sarah's Bestiary gets buried. It's an enchant creature. And it reads, target creature cannot attack, block, or use any ability that includes the tap in the activation cost. Right? So Sarah Bestiary is actually quite strong. Now, if uh, Michael has to face a Sarah Bestiary himself, he actually can get rid of it with the Miracle Worker. So Miracle Worker, I'm excited to see it in a deck, you know, and, and unfortunately in this matchup, it's not gonna be very relevant, um, but it is cool to know that within this format as a whole, actually Miracle Worker is pretty strong because it's one of the only ways to get rid of enchantments. It's really difficult when you play with the Dark Fallen Empire Homelands to, to get rid of enchantments. There's no Tranquility, there's no Disenchant. It's just really, really difficult. And a card like Miracle Worker can kind of do that job for you, although it's limited to enchant creatures that are enchanted on uh, creatures that you control. So it's not it's not that much of a miracle, but <laughs> but it's it's something at least. Uh, another card I'd like to point out, simply because you probably don't know what it does, is uh, Rushka the Slayer. So Rushka the Slayer, two white and three to cast. Beautiful art by Christopher Rush, um, and it reads: Can block creatures with flying. If assigned to block any black creatures. Rushka the Slayer gets plus one, plus two until end of turn. And this is just such an interesting card because um, it's got the giant spider ability, but it's not green, it's white. So it's kind of odd. Um, and it can always block any creatures with flying. So not just black creatures, no, any creatures. In a, in a sense, it makes, um, in a way it makes sense, I mean, because it looks like she's holding a bow, right? I mean, I guess that's an arrow you see at her eyesight that she's about to shoot an arrow. Um, so... It kind of makes sense. And then she gets a bonus when she blocks black creatures. So unfortunately for for us today, um, the deck of his opponent only uh, has one black creature. That's Baron Sengir. Uh, I guess she could block Baron Sengir, but then she'll become a 4-5 and still die to the Sengir. But uh, enough about the, uh, the rush guy. If we, if we look at the rest of the deck, uh, I guess we've discussed most relevant cards here. I guess Dust to Dust is going to be quite strong. Remove two artifacts because um, I think Baron is playing with quite a lot of artifacts on the, you know, to, to get rid of those swords and those shields that he's playing with. So that could be relevant, I guess. Uh, I also like the Witch Hunter. I think it's a very cool card. We also see four AO piles in this list. I think when I look at this deck, I think this deck for me is a favorite purely because it's more consistent and it seems to have a pretty good mana curve, right? It seems to kind of curve out and, you know, he's, he's kind of working on a bigger plan. I do believe that um, the deck of, uh, of Baron might be a little bit more surprising, right? There, there are a lot of, there are more different tricks in that deck, but I think this deck is more consistent and therefore is my slight favorite for whatever that's worth. Uh, let me know in the comments below what deck is your favorite, by the way. And uh, now we've had the deck techs they're out of the way, so we can finally go to the match and uh, match us and kind of enjoy enjoy the uh, the decks battling against each other. So get ready because we are going to go to game number one. Let's go. And here we go, game number one. Barry Nick sitting on the left, I believe he's on the play, and Michael Troop on the right, and they're starting with. A, is that a Dwarven Hold? One of those storage lands that comes into play tapped. We see Michael Troop starting with an Ecasian Javelinier. So that's a good start for Michael, able to put some pressure on. Probably next turn, there's a basic Mountain and he's passing turn here. 
Let's see, Michael tapping two white for an AO pile, attacking here with the 1-1, one, one, and Baron dropping to 19. And there we see that storage land ticking up. Remember, during your upkeep, if it's still tapped, you can put a storage counter on there. And uh, playing an IO pile himself, as well as second mountain and an IO pile. So if he wants to, he can get rid of the Javelin here. I don't expect him to. Ooh, and there we see an Elven Leer, and this is quite interesting. So if Baron Nick would decide to use his AO pile in response, Michael can use his Elven Leer to save one of his creatures. Remember, the Elven Leer, you can pay one in sack to give something plus two, plus two. There we see a second AO pile from uh, Baron here. Tapping three. Ooh, this is bad news. There is that dusty dust. In response, using one of the AO piles to kill the Cajun Javelin here. But that is a pretty good dust to dust, getting rid of two of those artifacts. And there we see a shield cast by Baron Nick and another AO pile by Michael. And that shield, you can tap it to give target creature plus O plus 2, I believe, or plus O plus 3. I would have to look it up. It's plus O plus 2, and it's called a spirit shield. And there we see, in the meantime, that uh, Abby Gargoyle, that 3-4 flyer, and that can do some business, although there's a Mace of If there, as exactly, Baron is using that Mace, sending the Gargoyle right back. And I think that Mace is going to be quite an issue for Michael. And there we see a Narwhal, 2-2 First Striker Pro Red. And if he can find the Zeon Sword, he can actually make it pretty big. But of course, uh, Michael also has those two AO piles. But Michael knows if I use an AO pile, Baron is going to use the shield in response. And Baron knows if I'm going to use the shield, then Michael is going to use the AO pile in response. So it's kind of a trigger battle right now. And now he's tapping completely out to play the um, the Rashka, the card that we talked uh, talked about. Rashka the Slayer, so that is a 3-3 three, three, for 5 that can block flying creatures. And this could be a moment where actually Baron could equip the shield to the Narwhal because Michael doesn't have any mana anymore to activate the AO piles, choosing not to playing a giant oyster instead. So this is an 0-3 creature, and I guess uh, Michael is asking, what? what is that? What does it do? Well, giant oyster, you can tap it to keep target tapped creature tapped if you can still follow of your opponent and then it doesn't untap during the upkeep and every upkeep of baron it would then get a minus one minus one counter so we see kind of a blurry blurry screen here thank you baron trying to get the focus back oh man this is this is taking a while all these interesting techniques here okay it's back that's good and uh, passing turn now. Interesting, I kind of expected him to maybe use the shield. There we see Sarah's Bestiary. So Sarah's Bestiary, that enchant creature that takes away the abilities of a creature. It cannot attack, it cannot block, and it cannot use any abilities. And now it uses an AO pile on the Narwhal, and in response, Baron Nick is using the Spirit Shield. And there we see an attack, and he's actually sending back uh, Rashka and taking three damage from the Abbey Gargoyle. And look at that storage land, by the way, really ticking up. And if Baron can draw into a Dwarven Catapult, he can start using the Dwarven Hold, which is quite on flavor. Ooh, we see another card, Retribution. And that means that Michael now needs to sacrifice a creature and put a minus one, minus one counter on another one. And they're actually talking about it. Maybe it's not possible because the Abbey Gargoyle has protection from red, so he cannot target two creatures and therefore he cannot play it. That's quite interesting. Let me know in the comments below how that works, by the way. Because I'm not sure like who's targeting it. It is a red card, of course, so I guess you cannot target the uh, the Abbey Gargoyle here. And there we see another Sarah's Bestiary. And there is an attack here. Two creatures. Remember, the creatures with Sarah's Bestiary cannot do anything. They're completely out of the game. Sending back the Gargoyle, thinking about blocking Rashka, yes or no. Remember, um, the Narwhal is now a 2-4 because of that Spirit Shield, but of course he's hesitant to block uh, because of the Elven Leers and the uh, Aeo Pile in the game. So it's quite difficult here for Baron. Stuck on 11, under pressure. What can he do here against Michael's forces? 
and he's just passing turn, which is great news for Michael. Michael going in again. And, you know, he's got the maze, of course. That will buy him some time, but he's still taking way too much damage. There's a Fisher on Reshka. That is pretty good news. So Reshka gone. Interestingly enough here, he also could have chosen to play the Fisher on the lands of Michael because he's, he's paying a lot of lands to keep those Saras bestiaries around. Because remember, you need to pay two white during your upkeep or they get buried. I do think it's a good good decision, of course, in this particular case to play Fisher on the Reshka because he's already on 11. Untapping the shield, that's quite interesting here. Probably trying to save his Narwhal because what he wants to do, he wants to use the Spirit Shield in response of an Aeopile activation. That's basically how he wants it to work. Now his issue, of course, here is that that Abby Gargoyle is still a 3-4, so it can kill the Narwhals. Attacking with both the Narwhals, this is unexpected. Sending back the one he, he's blocking, okay, then it makes sense, dealing two more damage. This is pretty good um, magic here from Baron's side. So Baron is attacking, of course, and he doesn't have the maze anymore to prevent the damage. He's going to drop to eight. And, ooh, there we see serrated arrows. With that serrated arrows, he can slowly kill those narwhals. Baron really needs something to get rid of the gargoyle. Although that one maze is doing the work, I guess. Attacking here, and there we see Michael dropping down to 14. Tapping four. Okay, there we see a Knight of Thorn. That's a 2-2 with Banding Pro Red. So another creature that cannot be targeted by any red spells. This is an issue for Baron because most of his removal is red. And there he goes, just attacking again with the two Narwhals. And there's a minus one, minus one counter on one of them. That's quite interesting because then, and in response, he's going to put a Spirit Shield on another and he's taking the damage. Quite interesting here. So Michael's dropping to 12. There's the attack by both of the creatures. Gonna maze the gargoyle, taking two damage. Gonna go to six here. Using both the leers, that means six damage, plus two, plus two per leer. And that's, oh, that's it with the AO pile, of course. Okay, I had to do the math here, took a while. So the uh, Knights of Thorn became a six, six because of the sack of the double leer. Um, and then the Aeopile dealt the final two damage. So this was game number one. Now we're going to let these creatures sideboard and we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two and we're off to the races. Baron slamming that island on the playmat, starting this game off. And there is planes by Michael. And there is a, it's called a Sea Sprite, I believe, 1-1. One, one. Ooh, Occasion Javelin here for Michael here. Missing a land drop, by the way. So that's uh, bad news, but good news in terms of that Acacian Javelin here is perfect to now kill that Sea Sprite. There we see a Spirit Shield from Baron, but no mana to use the Spirit Shield. It's two and tap to activate. So there's the uh, Javelin counter going off there to kill the Sea Sprite. And ooh, interesting, Reveka, Wizard Savant, two blue and two for an O1, one and you can tap it to deal two damage to any target, but then it doesn't untap the next turn. But, you know, it can do some work here, especially against this uh, smaller, uh, you know, white weenie strategy of Michael. Ooh, Aeopile getting rid of the Reveka. Good news here for Michael. Unfortunate for Baron that he doesn't have the mana to end play a creature and use a spirit shield. Um, this is, I believe, Anaba Bodyguard 2-3 First Strike Minotaur from the Homelands expansion. And it's got, yeah, it's got First Strike. And what is Michael doing now? Finally finding some lands, it seems. So that's at least good news for him. Tapping two, playing the Elven Leer. Tapping two more to cast the um, the Order of Lightbur. That's the word I was looking for. 2-1 First Striker Pro Black. Another Sea Sprites here, attacking with the 2-3. Two, I don't expect him to block on this. He's probably gonna drop exactly. He's gonna drop to 17. And now he's going to untap it after damage is dealt with the Maze of If. Maze of If is such a versatile card these days. And let's see what Michael can do. I mean, I guess he can just attack, you know, pump the knight, sack the leer, it gets plus two, plus two. But he's doing something completely different, playing another leer and an Aeopile here. Aeopile can deal two damage, and it's quite tricky with the Spirit Shield, right? There we see an Aeopile from Baron Nick 
using it straight away, forcing Michael to use one of his elven leers to save his order of light bird. So he's basically trading an AO pile for one of those elven leers. I don't think that's a bad decision. It kind of makes sense here. Attacking with both creatures, dealing three damage there. We see Michael's life total drop to 14. Baron still on a healthy 19. And what is he going to do? Of course, he can attack with both the creatures now. First, he's playing a serrated arrows. Oh, man. Attacking with both, sending back the order, taking a damage probably from the javelin here, exactly dropping to 18. And I think that serrated arrows can do some work. Remember, those are three arrowhead counters. And he's putting his spirit shield on his sea sprite. And interestingly enough, Michael did not respond by using the AO pile. Although I now doubt if Baron was doing that or not. I guess he wasn't. Because it's not like tapped or under the, the Sea Sprite. Attacking for three now. Is he going to use his serrated arrows? That's exactly what he's going to do. And then in response, I guess Baron Nick can use the Spirit Shield. And he's just letting it die. Interesting. We cannot hear the audio, of course, between the two players. So I'm sure they're like sharing some audio. Remember, this is also times two, right? So it may seem as a very quick decision, but actually it took uh, longer because these videos go at twice the speed. So Michael dropping to 12 and that spirit shield just really complicates it because you know, you can use it in response, but if you use it before, then of course Michael can in response use a serrated arrow or an AO pile or whatever. Okay, there we see Hand of Justice. We talked about the hand earlier. And ooh, in response, he's gonna cast his Dwarven Catapult. That is a good decision. So before the Hand of Justice hits the table, he's gonna use his Dwarven Catapult to get rid of both of those little 1 1 creatures. And at the same time, Michael stepped out, so he cannot use the Elven Leer. To save one of his creatures. Really good move here by Baron. What can he do? He needs a flyer to kind of fly over that 2-6. Because remember, the Hand of Justice is not just a good creature. It's also a great blocker. It's a 2-6. So it's not just its ability that makes it strong. It's also the stats that makes it strong. And there's an Abbey Gargoyle. And Things are not looking great for Baron at the moment. He just is forced to pass on. And then you get this minus one, minus one game going. So it's now a one-two bodyguard. Not as strong anymore. And he can even make it into an 0-1 bodyguard. Attacking with both here. Sending back the gargoyle. Putting his spirit shield on the bodyguard. I wonder if he's going to use his ale pile in response or maybe I'm mistaking, or maybe I'm forgetting. Okay, he's putting the Elven Leer on. So that means the, it's becoming a 4-8. And yeah, it dies. It dies. And there we see an Order of Lightbird also hitting the table. Oh, this is looking very bad here for Baron. Yeah, he can kill the Order of Lightbird. That is something, but it's not going to take away his problems. The good news for him is that he's on 18, so he's got some time to kind of bounce back from this. There we see an attack, probably going to send back the Gargoyle, taking two from the hand, going to go to 16. There is a Miracle Worker, the card from the Dark that can remove enchantments on your creatures. There we see an untap. A Mountain. What is he going to do next? He needs a small Miracle himself. Tapping six, another Hand of Justice. So now he's got the Hand of Justice situation online. Now it's going to be interesting if we're going to see um, Michael attack with his hand as well. And he is. And there we see, I believe that was a Fisher on one of the Hand of Justice. Is only taking one damage, going to 15. So Baron is pretty good at not dying. But yeah, the problem is you need to do more than not die, right? Yeah, yeah. There's a Joven. And Joven, pretty cool. Uh, three and tap, destroy target artifact, which actually relevant in this case but there's a Sarah's bestiary so that means that Joven is not doing anything anymore and there we see another attack taking I believe three damage this time or yeah from the miracle worker and the hand of justice there we see an occasion javelinier attacking again sending back the gargoyle gonna drop to 12 here or gonna drop to nine sorry he was already on 12 
And playing another bodyguard, 2-3 Minotaur from Homelands. It's not going to save him though, empty-handed as well. Things are looking really, really good for Michael Troop. He just seems to be having the better deck in this matchup. Another minus one, minus one counter, shrinking the bodyguard to a 1-2. And it looks like it's just a matter of time. He can swing in now again. Although there's, of course, that one, two. And yeah, the um, straight arrows has to go. And there he plays his Dusty Dust, targeting his own Felber Stone and destroying that Spirit Shield. That allows him to kill the Bodyguard with the AO Pile and now attacking with everything that he has, dealing th uh, three, no, four damage, actually. Going to drop to five here. There's the Narwhal, but that's not going to save him. That's not going to save him. He can actually kill the Narwhal now with the Hand of Justice if he wants. It's probably better to just attack. He is thinking about it. So attacking with... Ooh, he's changing his mind. Yeah, attacking with Hand of Justice and the Gargoyle. Sending back the Gargoyle. Taking two from the hand. Going to three. Remember, Michael also has a Javel Javelin counter. Another Narwhal. They're actually quite good blockers because they have first strike. But remember that Hand of Justice has six toughness. It's like a wall by itself. A wall that can attack, right? It's, it's really strong, the 2-6. Don't underestimate that six toughness. It's a problem in this matchup. Attacking with both. Sending it back. And he has to block. If he doesn't block, he's going to get killed by the Javelin counter. He doesn't want to block. I, you, you, got, you have to block here, Baron, or else you're dead. You're going to go to one, and then there's a javelin counter that's going to... No! Javelin counter! Ah! I'm sure you knew, Baron. I think you just wanted to get killed by the javelin counter. Just a, a javelin going your way. Ah, that's taking you out here in game number two. Now, the nice thing about this tournament is that every game win counts. You get points according to the games you've won. So if you lose one, two you still earn a point. So that means that both these players are going to continue with game number three. Let's go. Game number three. Here we go. Can Baron get a victory against this deck? I must say, Michael, your deck is looking mighty strong. There is a Sea Sprite. At least there's not um, an Occasion Javelin here. So there is some damage. Only Islands for Baron here, by the way. Remember, he plays uh, three different colors. And there's the Order of Light Burr. The 2-1 Pump Knight, you can give it first strike, and for 2 white, you can give it plus 1, plus 0. Oh, and Baron here asking, do you want to pump the Knight? And he does. He's going to pump it to a 4-1, so dealing a lot of damage here. There's the Dwarven Hold, the Storage Land. And, uh, ooh, that camera is getting very blurry, Baron. We'll try to hang in, hang, uh, hang in here. Michael now on, okay, yeah, there he's doing his trick again to try to get that focus back. In the meanwhile, by the way, Michael has attacked again. Look at that life total of Baron. Are you now on six already? No, really? I don't think so. He's on 16. Okay, that's it. He's on 16. There are the two other dice. So uh, try, <laughs> try to get the focus back of the camera. <laughs> I love it. Uh, Baron also has his own YouTube channel, by the way, with some magic content on there. It's pretty cool. I'll put a link in the description below. Um, definitely worth a visit. He's now dropping to 14, uh, playing another Sprites, 1-1 one, one Flyer Pro Red. And, uh, you know, he can deal a little bit of damage, but it's not going to do much. There's another attack. This time by the Gargoyle and the uh, Order of Lightbird. That's a lot of damage here. Things are looking bad again for Baron in this matchup. And he has to block one of the Orders, or at least he chooses to. And he's going to drop here to 11. Finding that Maze again, at least that kind of works. Um, Maze is restricted, by the way, in this format. So Baron is quite lucky to find it so often. And there is another... Ecation Javelinier, and there's a full-on attack here, taking three more damage from the Gargoyle. And I mean, those Orders of Light Burr are now just really, really strong because of all those uh, white mana. And there he's untapping his Dwarven Hold. Will we see... Oh, that's so cool! Mariam! And uh, yeah, he's showing it here. And uh, it's a... Uh, what is it? A 6-8 or a 6-6? Six, six? Yeah, he's reading it. It's got this, this um, ability that it can actually deal damage, or was it minus one, minus one counters? I'm actually going to look it up as well. So the Marion, it's a two blue and five to cast for an 8-8. Eight, eight. 
And um, yeah, what it what it does is you can pay two blue to give minus one minus O until end of turn. Um, and Marion deals one damage to target attacking creature without flying. So in theory, it can it can kill something, and I guess it can block something as well. And oh, we're already done. Okay, wow, that that went really really quickly. So uh, this is the game, and that's uh, O3 for Michael. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Michael's deck was way too strong here to compete with Baron. It was cool to see those nice cards in your brew, Baron. But um, Michael, congratulations. You've got the first three points um, here in the Wizards Cup. And how the Wizards Cup uh, works is these are actually the group stage matches. So everybody's in a group of at least three other players, sometimes four other players. So the groups are four or five players um, that's a, a big, that's the size of the groups. And then after the groups, the first two advance to the top 16. So there's a top 16, then a top eight and so forth. And we're gonna show you uh, a match from the Wizards Cup every Tuesday. And I believe we're gonna dive right into the top 16 next week. So uh, last week, if you haven't seen that first episode, um, you know, check check the channel, check the playlist, and, and you can find episode one where you saw actually uh, me, yours truly, in action against one of the decks and this was the second um uh, match from the group stages so just a lot of fun a lot of goofy decks and if you want to know more about this tournament see more of the decks uh find out what the restricted list for this tournament is because maybe you want to play this format yourself as well you can check out the description below there you will find a link to the tournament website with all the ins and outs of the Wizards Cup. And please do join us again next week, Tuesday, with another match from this exciting, amazing Wizards Cup. I mean, where else do you see this much Homelands on YouTube? Right here on Timmy Talks, of course. Talking about all that, if you want to support the channel, leave a like, leave a comment, share it on your socials. Let me know what you think of this tournament and also subscribe if you're not a sub yet. All those things really, really help the channel grow and, uh, and help me keep doing what I'm doing here for you guys. Uh, talking about that, you can also become a patron of the channel. If you become a patron, you can actually join into these goofy, crazy tournaments. How does it work? Well, there's probably an info card popping up right now that will take you to the Patreon page of Timmy Talks, and there you can find all the info. Talking about that, uh, let's go to the end scroll, and let's take a look at all the fantastic, amazing, wunderbar channel members and patrons of Timmy Talks. Ik het dus, ik het dus, zomba kazing.